Y'all, good morning. I really, really love it when a conference has a one-word theme, because that's like right in my wheelhouse as a dictionary editor. I feel very comfortable with the single word at a time. I'm like, I can work with this. Um, and uh, did anyone else read the logo as Rebel Lion? Yeah, I was like, that is an awesome name for a band. <laughs> OK, so yeah, that's it. wait, wait, this still doesn't look right. One more? Oh, that looks better. Um, so obviously, lexicographers are the first people you think of when you think of rebels, right? Dictionary editors? <laughs> you can see that we're always the first on the barricades when the time comes. And, and, and of course, this is what we think of when we think of rebellion, right? You know, guns, shouting, fire in the streets. But in my professional opinion, I think that we can broaden the definition of rebellion. And really, rebellion is just trying to make the world match your understanding of it. You believe things should be one way. The world believes things should be another way. And you're going to change the world to match your understanding. Why force something that doesn't fit? Why not just make a square whole? So, if we think that the rebellion changes the world, does it really matter what the time scale is? It doesn't have to be an overnight overthrow. It can be the steady remaking of the world through pure force of conviction, like water wearing away stone. We have slow food. We have slow fashion. Why can't we have slow rebellion? And, and many things that we think of as being revolutions, like scientific revolutions, were not the kind of sudden overthrow, lots of shouting rebellions. Um, you know, this is what Max Planck said very famously about uh, scientific revolutions, that they don't triumph. You just have to outlive the bastards. <laughs> And, and so, especially when you're thinking about the, the revolution, the rebellion that comes with a new idea, um, sometimes a slow rebellion is the way to go. And of course, when you want to change the world, um, it helps that the way that I have wanted to change the world affects one very, very small part of the world. I wanted to change how dictionaries were made. Uh, this is how people really think dictionaries are made. You take the language, you grind it up, and then you have this kind of consistent sludge of dictionary. And that's not very entertaining to me, and I don't think it's very helpful to people. So here's the way that I think that dictionaries should be made, that they should represent every single word in the language, no matter what. And that meaning is what determ uh, that usage is what determines meaning. Meaning is determined by how people use a word. And that, yes, that means every word, even the ones you don't like. Um, and if you want to argue with this, I'm really happy to argue with this um, with you at the party tonight. But I should warn you that I don't drink. And if when we argue about this, you're drunk and I'm sober, I'm going to win. <laughs> But it's OK, because if you're drunk enough, you won't remember losing. So that'll be fine. <laughs> so if you were here at uh, Pop Tech in 2008, you might have, be having a moment of deja vu right now, because I was right here on this stage when we announced wordnik.com, which is the, the dictionary that I have been making. Uh, and I should probably make some kind of inception joke right here. Um, I thought about wearing that dress again. <laughs> Um, but I decided to just show you our throwback logo. Um, this is nice, right? You can hardly tell that it was done in a style I like to call half-assed illustrator. Um, anyway, that's enough of that. This is our logo. So WordNick has been going on for six years. Since 2008, the people at PopTech were the first people to see our alpha version, the first people to get to try it out. And so I think that if one human year is like seven dog years, then six human years is like 42 internet years, right? Like six years on the internet is a really long time. And so the advantage of a slow rebellion is that it gives you time to learn things while you're changing the world. If you have a sudden overthrow rebellion, there's not really time to reflect. But six years is a long time to reflect. 
And I try to learn something every day, no matter how dumb, and I like to tweet it. So T-I-L-T means thing I learned today. And this is something I learned back in August that I have not yet, unfortunately, had the opportunity to put into practice, which is Baconados are skewers of bacon-wrapped jalapeno cheese balls. <laughs> so I try and learn something every day. And <laughs> but I think that the most valuable kind of knowledge is that which you acquire through noogenesis. Noogenesis is a fantastic word, and it means the acquisition of new knowledge from observation and experience and from inferring relationships between known things. And so with six years of WordNik on the internet, a lot of what we've learned, what I've learned, are some assumptions that got validated. Um, so my favorite thing that we've learned is the assumption we went with going in is that meaning of a word equals usage of a word, and you can infer meaning from usage. So this is a STEAM, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Art, and Math. You read that sentence, you know what STEAM means. You don't need a traditional dictionary definition. You're good. You can move on with your life. And uh, I want to point out the citation for the second example. Um, John Maida was saying, oh, you know, you need the A for art to turn STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math, to STEAM. And another thing that I've learned that made me really happy is that people really do love words. Sometimes when you really love something, you just extrapolate and believe that the universe really loves something. But it turns out lots of people love words. And so a hun there have been 158 some odd thousand words that have been marked as a favorite on wordnick.com. So that's roughly three new favorite words an hour for six years, which is pretty cool. And people like to collect words. So people have made more than 40,000 lists on Wordnik, and those lists comprise 1.7 million words. 1.7 million words were considered important enough for people to put them on a personal list. And also, we found out that people need to add words to other things. So the Wordnik API has been called that many times. And in fact, just backstage, I was talking with Brent, who helps run this thing, and he's actually made something with the Wordnik API. He has this little cool tool that puts his word of the day on his own blog. And so learning all this was great, and learning all this was gratifying. But there were a lot of things that we didn't know going in. And one of the things we didn't know, what I didn't know, is what things were going to be easy and what things were going to be hard. Now, Larry Wall, if you don't know, he was the inventor of the programming language Perl, and which is the first programming language I did any kind of professional, non-school coding in. And uh, I should really embroider this on a sampler. Um, but <laughs> another famous Perlism is that there's more than one way to do it, which I think is also a great mantra for slow rebels, right? If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And he also said something that I used to have on a sign above my desk that I had photocopied from one of the Perl programming books that said, we want you to uh, acquire the three chief vir virtues of a programmer, which are laziness, impatience, and hubris. Um, <laughs> so we found out a lot of things that we thought would be easy were easy. We found out a lot of things that we thought would be hard were, in fact, possible. But the hardest thing, the thing that I was the most uncertain of when we first started WordNik was this. Now, this is a core question. And it was like, how does WordNik make money? Because when you have a startup, that's one of the things you're trying to find out, right? What's the business model? And so this is the answer I posted to this core question. I don't know how many of you are South Park fans, but they had an episode where um, there were these underpants gnomes, and this was their business model. Um, <laughs> This is my most upvoted answer on Quora, by the way. Um, and only two of those people who upvoted were actual WordNik employees at the time. Um, so, but it turns out, our thesis was that if you knew a lot about a lot of words, that that data would be valuable. And it turns out with Reverb Technologies, we've made the Reverb iPad and iPhone reader app that you can use a word graph to build a content discovery platform that helps you discover articles based on your interests rather than your demographics. It's been downloaded nearly half a million times, and people use it to read about five to eight times longer than they do in competing apps. So when you know all the words, you know a lot about aboutness, and you can help people find what they're really interested in. So yay, business model, right? And this works great. And so I like to say that when we started WordNik, we were trying to make panning for gold, you know, finding out information about words more efficient 
and more scalable. And we thought that that data would be gold, that it would be very valuable. And we were right. But it turned out to be even bigger than we thought. So sure, we scaled up panning for gold, that was great. But in the process, what we basically got was hydroelectric power. So it wasn't as much the gold that was important, but the process. The process of ingesting and analyzing and building a word graph out of billions of words was very powerful. So that's great, right? Rebellion accomplished, industry disrupted, product market fit, business model found, customers happy. Well, when this slide came up yesterday, did anybody else kind of feel like this was a message to them personally? <laughs> yes, it was like, yay, the universe. It's time to tell us something. So I'm very happy with Reverb Technologies. I'm really proud of what we built. We built a fantastic technology that helps publishers reach millions of people with relevant, useful content. It makes readers happy. It makes writers happy. But that actually turned out to be easier than I expected. So it's not the hardest thing. The hardest thing for me is how can I make 120,000 word decks happy? And how can I make that number 10 times bigger? Because really, the English language belongs to everybody. The English language is something that we all share together. The only reason it exists is because we all agree to understand each other when we speak it. That's what the English language is. And so today, I'm happy to announce that in order to further our mission of making as much information as possible, about as many words as possible, available to as many people as possible, that Wordnik is going to become a not-for-profit corporation. Whoa. So, yes! <laughs> and this feels hard and scary, <laughs> but I'm so happy about it because it means that I can ask for help. I can ask people who love and want to be part of the English language to join me to make that information available to everyone. And um, this URL is live right now. And so I thought, well, what's, people love words. There are so many, you know, favorite words on WordNIC. Wouldn't it be nice to let people adopt a word? Just like you can adopt a highway. <laughs> and when you adopt a word, we can help spruce it up a little bit. And, you know, the, the charismatic words like serendipity and calipigian will help support the words that nobody likes, like impact. And <laughs> um, so, this is an alpha, alpha, alpha. Like once again, pop techers are going to be the first people to get to try out something new with WordNick. Um, but that's live, and you can reserve your word. And today, uh, John already grabbed design. So sorry, folks. Um, and let me know what your ideas are, like what you're interested in, what you'd like us to do. Because again, the English language belongs to everyone. And by making WordNick open, nonprofit, we can do all the things for which there really is no business model. If anybody knows an excellent business model for writing etymologies, please let me know. <laughs> Everybody loves them. Nobody wants to pay for them. Um, so I hope to be back at PopTech in 2020 in another few years to give you another update. And so thank you so much for your kind attention. I also want to thank Joey, if he's in the off audience specifically, because especially for all this work with Creative Commons, because all of these images were Creative Commons licensed um, from Flickr. And this presentation itself is Creative Commons licensed. So if you'd like to use all these same slides to give a completely different talk, um, <laughs> please let me know. I will make them available to you. Thank you so much. Yeah.